Thank you, Ensemble. Let's uh, continue in our reading from the book of John, chapter 9. We'll be reading verses 8 through 12. You'll find that on page 566 of the Pew Bible. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is it not he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. This is the word of the Lord. This is one of my favorite passages in Scripture, not just because of what Jesus did, but how the man responded. And it's filled with some tremendous deep truths as we study and look into the Word. Jesus healed a man that was, born, that was born blind, and the public outcry was great against Jesus, much like it was in John and the fifth chapter when he healed the man uh, who was a paraplegic, but he did both those incidents on the Sabbath. So this really is a crucial text for us and a crucial passage to really understand. The Pharisees reacted indignantly. They accused Jesus because of of healing on the Sabbath, they said, in their opinion, he cannot be God. And others point out sufficiently that if he did what he did, then no man could do it but God. And so there was the disturbance and the argument between uh, the Pharisees, the Jews, and others that would agree that Jesus was God. Then in verse 1 through 3 that was read for us a few moments ago, the Bible reveals that there is really several purposes or reasons for suffering. The text said the disciples said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? And he was born blind. And uh, the scripture traces various sufferings due to moral causes, such as death for the uh, example as a result of Adam's sin and the entire death passed upon the entire human race. In Exodus chapter 20 and Numbers chapter 14, the sins of parents cause uh, suffering in children. And Deuteronomy 28 and Jeremiah 31 talk about individual personal sins that, that can cause difficulty and suffering in the life of the individual. Among the Jews, it had became a misguided uh, idea and tradition that suffering was due to a peculiar or particular sin that might take place in a person's life. So they asked Jesus the question, why is he blind? Now remember, many Jews, like Job's friends, believe that in this time there was even uh, a temporal misfortune was due to sin in the life of an individual, some specific sin. There was also the concept of prenatal sin, the idea that an unborn could commit sin. It was something that was thought of in that day. So the question is asked, who sinned, this man uh, or his parents? Now, he was born blind, so the idea was he had the sin in the womb, and that was the thought of the day. And by the way, there are some non-Christians that will point to this passage and say the Bible does not say that uh, reincarnation is wrong. And they go to this verse of Scripture, which is obviously uh, mistaken, but they'll, they'll come to that verse. Jesus makes it clear that it is neither the, the man nor his parents. And he did not deny the connection between sin in the individual's life and suffering that may come, but he refuted the idea that this was accurate concerning this man and his blindness. And Jesus point blank says the man is blind so that God's work can be seen. And that brings an interesting thought that we'll look at in a few moments. God's sovereignty and God's purposes are at play throughout the scripture. We read it in Job 1 and 2. We read it throughout the scripture. Some of the, uh, our sufferings, like the trials that Job went through, are for the glory of God. And either through the resulting refinement that might take 
place in our life because of what we've gone through or some spectacular work of God in our life that, that is a miracle that brings out the truth of, of God being present in, and God having a will in everything that's done. So understanding this, God's purpose may not always be known to us, but we have the assurance that what we go through, God does have a purpose. In verse 4 and 5 of the text, we must work the works of him that sent me while it's day, the night comes when no man can work. The direct meaning, obviously, was to the disciples, and they must accomplish the mission while it is, he's the light of the world, while he's still among us. This is our responsibility. But the phrase does not say or does not teach that somehow Jesus stopped being the light when he, when he died. That's, that's not what it's dealing with. But the light shined more brightly when he was here. That was, that was the thought. But the night's coming that uh, the darkness has really has a special meaning to the period of time that Jesus was taken and from his disciples during the crucifixion. And, and now it'll, it'll be a time of darkness, but now is the time to work. So as we see through the Gospel of John that there was an antagonism that took place between the Jews and the, and the, the religious leaders and Jesus. And it was always a battle of light and darkness. We see it in chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 8, and again in chapter 9. Jesus is the light of the world, and he's going to provide physical light for this man that uh, is before him. Then verse 6 through 10, having said these things, he spat on the ground, he made clay, he made mud with saliva. What's interesting is Irenaeus, who was a second century church father, he was born about 120 AD, lived uh, 50, 60, 70 years, I believe, and Irenaeus points to this passage and goes back to Genesis chapter 2 where God uh, created man out of the dust, out of the clay of the ground. And so Irenaeus is bringing this whole thing together and, and he equates that with Jesus being God. It's just an, an interesting thought. But in that passage, Jesus said to the man, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam, uh, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. And the neighbors and those who had, had seen him as a beggar were saying, is not this man that used to sit and beg? Some said, yeah, it's, it, it is he. Others said, no, uh, it, it, somebody looks like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes open? Severe problems. Many times in Bible times, they sat as beggars, and, and this is what the man did. But the people couldn't believe this was the same man because he had his sight. In verse 11, he goes on and said, the man, he said, who, who opened your eyes? He said, the man called Jesus, made this clay, anointed my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. His testimony was very simple. He said, uh, yet it was convincing. He recited the facts about his healing. That was me. I want you to know that. And he gives credit to the one that performed the miracle the man Jesus. Not only he just called him the man Jesus, he had not yet really understood who he was. He didn't understand what was to take place in his life in just a few moments. But he said the man called Jesus. He would come to understand who this man was in a few moments. Then beginning in verse 13, we didn't read that, uh, but let's follow me as I do. They brought uh, to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. I'm reading from the ESV. He said, now it was the Sabbath day, and when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes, so the Pharisees again asked him how he'd received his sight. He said to them, he put this clay, this mud in my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man's not from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. And uh, the other said, how can a man who is a sinner do such th signs? And there was division among them. So the Pharisees were the educated. And they were seriously guarded the faith. That was their job. And so they were the custodians of the faith. And being thus, it was right for them to bring this man before themselves to investigate. Now, what really happened to you? Now, their conclusions were wrong. But they were not out of line doing what they were doing. The fact was they, that they studied the miracle in detail really indicates to us that this man was really healed. He was, he was really able to see because they, they went to such lengthy examination. Since the man was born blind, the miracle was even greater because blindness could be caused by sickness, it could be caused by injury, and it might be a sudden 
a sudden healing. It could be something that just would coincidentally take place. But this man was born blind. That was what was causing them this great concern. Understand this. Our Lord's miracles can bear up under the scrutiny of the enemy anytime. Don't be afraid of what you believe and what somebody might say about what you believe because under the right circumstance, knowing the word of God, you're able to defend that because thus says the Lord. It bears up any scrutiny whatsoever. But Jesus' act was deliberately healing the man on the Sabbath day, and that caused great concern, as it did in John 5. It does so in this passage of Scripture. It was illegal to work on the Sabbath as far as the Jews were concerned. By making clay, by applying the clay, and by healing the man, he performed three unlawful acts. And that became the concern of the Pharisees. They ought to have been rejoicing in what Jesus did. Here was this man that was healed of his blindness. But they weren't concerned about that. Their opinion He could not be of God. This man, Jesus, could not be of God because of what he did on the Sabbath. Verse 17. So they said again to the blind man, they brought him back. They questioned him a second time. What do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, he's a prophet. So that's the reason. That's it. This is who he is. I mean, I like this guy because... The candor he had and what he's going to say in a few moments is really uh, shocking knowing the circumstances of the time. Verse 18, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight. I mean, they couldn't accept what the man had to say. So they called the parents of the man who'd received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents said, we know this is our son. And we know that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because many feared the Jews. They feared the Jews. And the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age. Ask him. When... The parents were afraid that they would be excommunicated, put out of the synagogue. They feared the Jews because the Jews had already agreed if anybody claims that Jesus is God, then they're exiled. They're out of the synagogue. Nobody can say he's the anointed one, the Messiah. Nobody can say he's the Christ or you're out of here. There's one word in the Greek language that talks about this, apagasunagas, which simply means desynagogued. Now, what, what, what does that mean? In Bible times, the Jew part of the synagogue would go there to learn the teaching of the Old Testament. But it was also the place of fellowship. But it goes even deeper than that. It involved everyday life. If they were going to the marketplace, it was the, the Jewish synagogue that oversaw that. If they were doing any type of business to have a job, everything revolved around the synagogue. So if you were unsynagogued, if you were released or kicked out of the synagogue, then, then I mean, you, your social life, you had no social life. Uh, you had no economical life because the economy would, would you not have anything to do with it. You couldn't buy or sell in the marketplace. And all your religious rights were gone. So it was a very serious thing to be cut off from Israel. And this man's parents were afraid of what might happen to them. Verse 24, so For the second time, they called the man who'd been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know this man's a sinner. Now, they were getting, trying to get him to say that it wasn't Jesus or that Jesus didn't do it. Give glory to God. Nothing mad with giving glory to God, but they wanted to go aside of Jesus. And and this man is going to give an answer, and he knows it could really mean being kicked out of the synagogue. So he says in verse 25, one of my favorite verses in Scripture Man says, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. So he still didn't know who Jesus was. He said, I don't know, I would, but this I know, where I was blind, now I see. What a testimony. I don't know all that happened, but I do know I was blind, and I do know I can see. And he says, it's because of this man. And the, and, and the Pharisees were stuck in a system the system of what they believed 
but the, but they could not accept something that would be contrary to that or something they didn't understand because Jesus was not contrary to the law. He said, I've not come to break it, I've come to fulfill it. But they were so entrenched in their system that they couldn't see Jesus. I know Christians that are so entrenched in a system that they really can't see sometimes the things of God. Verse 26, they, these Pharisees, the religious people said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? And I like this. He said, do you also want to become his disciples? I mean, sarcastically saying to them, well, you guys question me. Uh, do you guys really want to become his disciples? That's not what they wanted to do. But this guy was bold in coming out to, to these Pharisees, to these religious leaders. Just imagine he's standing up to them. In verse 28, they reviled him. I mean, they really jumped his case because of what he, was, what he said, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. You can almost see these guys uh, lifting their chin up and, and folding their hands over their breast and puffing themselves up and say, we're, we're followers of Moses. We know Moses. We don't know where you're coming from. We don't know where this guy comes from. In verse 30, the man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You did not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone has opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. So the man's going after them. Now he's focusing on their unbelief. And his conclusion is Jesus can only be from God because nobody can do these things that he's done to me unless he be of God. And that's what the Pharisees believed. So they were in a quagmire. What were they going to do? How are they going to understand all this? Verse 34, they answered him, you were born in utter sin and you teach us. And they cast him out. So he was the synagogue. He was cast out. Pharisees get angry. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they cast him out and having found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? And he answered, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, you've seen him and it is he who's speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I've come into the world that those who do not see me may see and those who see me May, who see may become blind. Jesus deals with the man. Man said, Jesus said, I, I'm, I'm the one that, that did it. I'm the son of man. That was the term that Jesus used uh, most of the time in referring to himself. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped. Didn't worship before that. But now Jesus reveals himself to him. He understands that and he believes. Now he worships him. And then verse 39, again, as we mentioned, Jesus said, for judgment I've come into the world. It seems to be a conflict between that and John 3, 17, for the Son of God sent not a son into the world, or God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, and there's no real conflict. The purpose of Jesus coming into the world is not to judge but to save. However, judgment is inevitable for those who fail to receive him. The preaching of the gospel has two effects. Those who admit that they do not see are given sight. That includes those of us here that have believed in Jesus Christ. But those who insist that they can see perfectly without the Lord Jesus spiritually or see things in life are confined to their own blindness and they'll be judged. We see that. People mock the things of God. They think they're right. They ridicule us. and We're dumb and we're ignorant, but they can see. They have the knowledge. And Jesus said, you're blind and you'll be judged. And that's what he's getting at. In verse 40, some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we all so blind? They expected a negative answer. And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains before you. So if you knew the lostness and the darkness and you cried for spiritual light, you would no longer be guilty of the sin of unbelief. But satisfied in the darkness, 
without really having the light continue in your rejection, that sin remains. So what can we learn from this? What do we understand? What was our takeaway? And how do we apply these things to our life? Now, the subject of blindness is a very important subject in the Scripture. All through the Scripture, blindness is a spiritual metaphor. Now, it doesn't mean these, this wasn't literal blindness, and it was. But Jesus used that as a spiritual metaphor to re- represent the inability of individuals to understand spiritual truth, God's truth. And as a man is physically blind, he could not see the visible revelation of God, which he can't see the trees, he can't see the earth, he can't see the sky, he can't see the things that God created. As a blind man cannot see light, the blind spiritual cannot see the light of the world, Jesus Christ. So what do we learn from that? First of all, our desire and and God's plan may not be the same. We preach it's always best to be in the will of God, and that is certainly true. We tell our young people to be in the will of God and stay that way, and it's always true. But understand this, God's will is always best, but it may not be the best for you. Now, don't turn me off. Understand what I mean by that. Let me explain it. Think of this story. If we made the decision or could make the decision, would you be born blind and then receive sight at the age of 20 or 40 or 60 or whatever? Or would you rather never be born blind? Well, I think Most of us, if not all of us, would say, I'd rather not be born blind. I'm sure this man would have rather been able to have sight from birth. But God allowed it for his glory. Jesus said that that the works of God might be revealed or might be displayed in him. So here's the important truth. The job of this man was to be born blind from birth to allow God to be God. Understand what I'm saying. The next time you struggle with the question of why something takes place in your life, consider that God will be shining more brightly in your brokenness. If it wasn't, he would not have allowed it to happen. He has a purpose in what he's doing. So again, God's will is always best. It may not be the best for you, and let me add this, in, 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 in your under, understandable or un, uh, under, under, understandable future, what you're looking at in the, in the future. It may be something you never understand this side of glory, why God allows what he allows in your life. It always comes down to this, and remember this, it's not about us, it's always about him. It's always about God. Number two, every believer is part of God's workforce The Savior knew that he had three years or so public ministry before he'd be crucified. And the light at that moment would go out temporarily. Of course, he's still the light of the world. Every moment at that time must be spent working for God. So here's a man that was blind from birth. Now, the Lord Jesus performs a miracle of healing on him, even though it was the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He told us that. The time of public ministry would soon be over and he'd no longer be upon earth. It was a solemn reminder to everyone who's a Christian in in this life that time is swiftly passing. The night's coming. Our, Our service on earth will end. We should take that time that we have to use for him. I've told you this before. I remember sitting in church with, uh, in, a, in meetings with uh, the boys were small and uh, preacher preaching. I never forget, it was, we were preaching. It was at a camp service and, and uh, I was preaching and listening to another guy preach at the time and he said, you only have 20 years or so with your kids. Give it the most you got. And I remember thinking, yeah, but 20 years is 20 years. That's a long time. And you don't realize how quick that passes. I mean, both my kids now, 50 years of age or older. And where, where'd it go? You know, the time, time just went. You do the best you can every day of your life in teaching them the things of God, and then they make their decisions, but it's important for us to teach. Several years ago, several years ago, I had seven people in our church write a devotional. 
I was going through a series of messages, not sure what it was, but, but uh, the seven people, like one would take Monday, one take Tuesday, so forth. So seven people did this, and we did this for uh, four, five, six months, whatever we were going through the series, and they wrote a devotional, and then we had those printed up, and then we'd use those during the series. And so these people, I met with them ahead of time. They had, they had their devotional. Uh, Sydney wrote one, and, and a couple of the ladies, a couple of men in the church would write these devotionals. And then we'd print them out, and then uh, the week I was on whatever passage it was, it would be distributed, or we'd have it for a month, and they would read it. It was, it was, it was really beneficial uh, to the people. And one of the ladies' name was Janet Huff, and she used an illustration about witnessing from this passage of Scripture. And she was on board a plane, and she said, talking about Jesus being the light of the world, and, and I was sitting next to a person, and I didn't witness to him. And what was interesting about these devotionals, you knew these people, and it really made you part of their life and, and understanding that we're all in this thing together. She said, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't witness to the person. How many times, and I thought about that, how many times have we withheld the light, the truth of the gospel? So I had to confess that hit me between the eyes. Every day we live, we live one day closer to eternity. It's one day less that we have to tell somebody about, about Jesus. I remember preachers preaching on the second coming of Christ saying, do you want to be in such and such a place if Jesus would come today? And, and do you want to be doing thus and thus if Jesus were coming at that moment? The more I read the word, the more I understand when Jesus comes, it's not so much about as to where I am, but to what I'm doing. I want to be busy doing the work of the Lord. Number three, prejudice can dictate our spiritual outlook. Now, there's several kinds of prejudice. We can have racial prejudice. We have social prejudice. We can have religious prejudice. And all of those are wrong. The man in Scripture was a recipient of the miracle by the hand of Jesus Christ. Immediately, when the news was spread, who did it? The Pharisees said, not so fast. It couldn't, it couldn't, he can't be of God because this was done on the Sabbath. They had a preconceived idea in their own mind of just who Jesus was because he did not fit into their perception of what they thought should happen. They rejected him. If someone doesn't dot the I across the T just like us, it's easy for us to push them aside. But we can't do that. If we do that, we become like the Pharisees. I mean, when we do that, we miss what God may be doing in somebody else's life. And they may be Bible-believing Christians that have a different approach or a different outlook on a passage of Scripture. And sometimes in our mind, when somebody says that or does that, we say they don't believe the Bible. That's, a, that's an easy comeback. Somebody disagrees with us and our take of scripture we don't believe the bible which certainly doesn't have to be true because there are a lot of people have a lot of different take on things of scripture and what what does the scripture say and what i like to say is let the word of god be the word of god don't make it what it is never intended to be you know scripture is not a science book never intended to be that uh, it's not a book on psychology. It never tended to be that. It gives us the history of Israel and gives us the, the way to get to God and how God works in our life. It's filled with that. Let the Bible be the Bible. Prejudice can affect our spiritual outlook. Number four, Jesus has a heart for castaways. I mentioned that devotional. Cammie Quinn was another writer, and she had a novel rejected after corresponding with an editor for two years. And the same week, she found out that she had a tumor in her right eye that was cancerous and had to have the eye removed. And she said in one week, she lost her health and lost her dream. Three months later, her father died. And she put it all down in her perspective as she wrote this, and I quote, the same compassionate God who walked outside of town to uplift the blind man claimed me through the ceremony of my father's funeral. End quote. I go back to what I said earlier. God's way is the best way, may not be the best way for you, and you may not, never understand why, and that's tough because it could be a difficult road. But Cammy understood this, and then she went on and said this. In that one day, God combined the loss of my eye, my love for my father, 
my love for writing in a unique and powerful way. It was a new beginning on a journey of which I never expected, end quote. You see, sometimes God allows those things in our life because we're going this way. He said, yeah, that's nice, but we're going to deviate in this direction. But this is the way you want to go. We don't understand that, and it's hard for us, but that's the direction that God takes us. Jesus sought this man out. The man said, if, if, if they do not, Jesus was saying to him, if they do not want you, I want you to know I do. Those that are cast away, those that uh, for the sake of Jesus have lost some things or maybe have lost nothing, but gained great blessing by a personal welcome and a personal fellowship with Jesus. I'm always amazed at the story of Elijah, the widow of, with crucible oil, and how she gave it to Elijah, willing to give it to him first before she fed herself and her son. She knew she was going to die, but she just, it was the prophet of God, and she was willing to give what she had, and God blessed her. And number five, believers have a personal accountability. It's easy to slough off responsibility to someone else. It's football season. You can watch, uh, watch games on TV, and invariably, almost every game, someone is penalized for a personal foul because they hit somebody. Usually, it's, and the announcers will say this, that it's always the second man that gets called. Your kids were small. They would say, well, you get, they get in trouble. Well, so-and-so did it first. The issue is not who did it second or third or tenth or first. The issue, as we always told our kids, the issue is you did it. If you did it, it's wrong. I don't care who did it before you. I don't care who did it after you. If you did it, it's wrong. You are accountable for yourself. So many times as Christians, we want to throw it off. The man stood before the Pharisees. He didn't back down. He was, had a responsibility to Jesus. And so do you and I. We have responsibilities to the Lord Jesus. Are we going to fulfill them? Are we going to be faithful to him? Are we going to honor him in our lives? Father, we're grateful for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the truth. We pray, Lord, as we think about this man and what he went through and his testimony of faithfulness to you, that we would be faithful. Whatever you are allowing in our lives, that we'd be faithful to you. For we have an anchor that holds. We pray your blessing, guidance. Take the thoughts today from the word and apply them to our heart. Be glorified in all that we do for you to be glorified in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Our closing hymn is number 377. There is a Redeemer, 377.
hearts bow in prayer. Father, we're grateful again for the Lord Jesus. We pray that you dismiss with your blessing. Give us a great week. We're thankful for our salvation. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that works in our life. We thank you. You are our Father. Give us a great day. Keep us safe, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.